It was disgusting. Give me not my stomach for the waffle. I was hoping I could make it some excuse for you guys to kill me. After several days of being interrogated by the police, 30-year-old Matthew Hoffman finally broke his silence and started talking, but no one was ready for the horror of what he had to say. I mean, it's one thing to love the great outdoors, but Matthew took his obsession with trees and leaves to a lethal level, and hiding in the roots of this case is a chilling confession you won't believe. Tina Herman was a hard-working 32-year-old living in the quaint town of Apple Valley, Ohio, with her two children. Beyond being a devoted mother, she was an incredibly reliable employee at the local Dairy Queen, who never missed a day of work. So naturally, when she failed to show up for her shift in November 2010, alarm bells ran off right away. Tina's absence was so unusual that her manager, Valerie Haythorn, decided to go drive by her home and make sure everything was okay. She noticed Tina's truck was in the driveway with another unknown car and that some lights were on inside the house, so she figured all was well and left. When Tina missed another day of work, Valerie went back to her house and reportedly knocked on the locked front door several times, but all she got in return was an eerie silence on the other side. The lights inside were still on, but strangely, Tina's truck was now gone from the driveway, and only the unknown vehicle was left. Valerie figured she could just climb in through a back window to see what was going on, a decision she would soon come to regret. As soon as she entered, Valerie stumbled upon a gruesome scene. The house was in complete disarray and a large amount of blood coated the floor, enough to warrant an urgent 911 call. Authorities rushed to the scene and it was quickly determined that Tina, her two children, 13-year-old Sarah and 10-year-old Cody, and the family dog, a miniature pincher named Tanner, were all missing. Furthermore, the car in the driveway belonged to Tina's 41-year-old friend, Stephanie Sprang, who was also nowhere to be found. An intensive search began immediately. Detectives spoke with Tina's boyfriend, but he explained that they were in the middle of an amicable breakup, so it wasn't strange that he hadn't seen her recently. With nothing connecting him to the disappearance, police focused on the children's father, Larry Maynard, but he too appeared genuinely distressed over the situation and had a rock-solid alibi. It was another frustrating dead end for the investigation. Detectives then turned to the public for help, giving photos to the media and pressing those close to the family for information. Finally, after putting out an alert on Tina's truck, there was a small break in the case. The missing vehicle was discovered roughly seven miles away from the family home in the Kenyon College parking lot. As they combed the scene, investigators couldn't help but notice an out-of-place man creeping around the parking lot. He said his name was Matthew Hoffman and that he was waiting for his girlfriend to get off work, so they let him go without any further questions. Due to the alarming circumstances surrounding the disappearances, the police recruited divers, boats, and helicopters to aid in the search. Yet everything they needed to crack this case wide open was right inside Tina's home. Investigators found Walmart shopping bags containing two tarps and a box of heavy-duty trash bags. Now anyone who knows true crime will tell you that these items are usually not a good sign, and they would be right in this case. But still, they found one other thing, a receipt. Detectives wasted no time requesting surveillance footage from the local Walmart, and wouldn't you know who they saw purchasing the tarps and trash bags? Creepy parking lot guy, Matthew Hoffman. Three days after the four individuals were reported missing, the SWAT team descended on Matthew's home. After throwing a flash grenade, officers barged in through the front door and found Matthew sleeping on a sofa, but only once he was restrained and taken into custody did they notice what was covering the floor. Leaves and lots of them. Matthew was completely obsessed with trees and leaves. Some sources even say that he was often spotted by neighbors sitting in the branches of a tree. The main living space was buried under a few feet of leaves, with over a hundred more bags of leaves lining the walls of the bathroom. But here's the weird thing, well, maybe not quite as weird as his fixation with the leaves, but there were only two trees near his house so he would have had to go to great lengths to bring that many leaves into his home. Police were initially concerned that the huge pile of leaves stuffed into the living room might be hiding something sinister, like a body. Disturbingly, they also discovered two dead squirrels next to a few red popsicles in his freezer. Police rummaged through the mounds of foliage but initially came up empty-handed, that is, until they entered the basement. Keeping all those leaves in the house is extremely bizarre and is evidence that Matthew was mentally ill. 
He may have had some strange beliefs or delusions about leaves which led to him collecting them. Tina's young daughter, Sarah Maynard, was discovered bound and gagged on a bed of leaves. While she didn't appear to be injured, she wore a makeshift diaper made from a plastic bag and seemed very confused, telling officers she was late for school and asking about her pet dog. Sarah had no idea what had happened to her mother and brother, but she did say that Matthew cut her finger with a knife, usually gagged her, and that he was going to release her before Christmas. With Tina, Cody, and Stephanie still missing, Sarah was placed in her father's custody after being thoroughly questioned and examined. Meanwhile, back at the police station, detectives were getting to know Matthew Hoffman, starting with his twisted backstory. He grew up in the Warren area in northeastern Ohio with his parents and moved to a different part of the state in 1997 following their divorce. One of his childhood neighbors remembered him as seeming very unhappy all the time, stating he was really lost, he was on a bad path. Matthew was regarded as unpredictable and strange by the few people who knew him. Some stated that he would kill squirrels to eat, light fires in his yard, and climb trees to spy on people. Police also learned that in 2001 he had been convicted of first-degree arson, theft, and burglary for lighting a condominium complex on fire in an effort to cover up the robbery. He served eight years in prison for these crimes. Matthew has a significant history of odd behavior which escalated to major crimes. Roughly one month before his arrest, Matthew and his girlfriend broke up after he allegedly choked her during an argument. Non-fatal strangulation is a major sign that someone will commit murder in the future. Roughly one month before his arrest, he was fired from his job as a tree trimmer for making his supervisor uncomfortable. Oh, and his dog had recently run away. Clearly, things weren't going great for him. However, the information investigators really craved wasn't about Matthew. They wanted to know where the other three victims were, but he wouldn't budge. Matthew was placed under 24-hour watch after crying and threatening to harm himself on the evening of his arrest. He then sat in excruciating silence for hours, refusing to answer any of the interrogator's questions. It's been a rough couple days for all of us. I'm sure you'd like to get some sleep. I'd like to get some sleep. But eventually, he started talking. So I had a really horrific dream last night. It was disgusting. Giving me a knot in my stomach, but but still, Matthew wanted to do things his own way, so he attempted to make a bizarre deal with investigators. He said that he would write down the location of the three bodies on a piece of paper and then fake an escape attempt so officers could shoot and kill him. I was hoping I could make some excuse for you guys to kill me. He wanted total control of the release of information. Obviously, the police weren't cool with his idea, but Matthew ultimately came clean anyways. In his written confession, he claimed to have murdered Tina, Stephanie, and Cody due to a burglary gone wrong, saying, I did not enter the house to kill those people. I did not know a single one of them. He claimed to have slept in the woods across the street from Tina's home the night before the attack. He then snuck in through the garage sometime the next morning after everyone had left, but when Stephanie and Tina returned home sooner than expected, he snapped and ambushed them. The kids returned home from school later that day to find a terrible scene. Matthew killed Cody and tied Sarah up using an electrical cord he found in the kitchen. Then he used Tina's truck to move the bodies. He has a pattern of committing a more serious crime to cover up a lesser crime. The arson he was convicted of in 2001 was his attempt to cover up his burglary. In the current case, he claims he only murdered Tina, Stephanie, and Cody because he got caught in the act of burglary. Matthew is trying to justify his actions and is not taking responsibility for what he did. He exhibited extreme impulsivity when he chose to murder them, when he was surprised by the victims returning home early. It's possible that he broke into their home not necessarily to steal valuables, but instead because he got a feeling of excitement by being in someone else's home uninvited. If he was only looking for things of monetary value, it's more likely that he would have gotten in and out quickly, and he would have been less likely to encounter the family. He told police that he couldn't bring himself to kill Sarah, but he admitted to stabbing the other three to death inside the house and processing their bodies to make their disposal easier. 
Oh, and in case you were wondering what he meant by processing, well, he dismembered the corpses, put them into trash bags, and then concealed them in a 60-foot tall hollow tree. As if that wasn't horrific enough, he also confessed to killing Tanner, the family pet, because he wouldn't stop barking. Matthew carried on, divulging that he had assaulted Sarah several times during her captivity. But as if trying to demonstrate what a great guy he is, he also told police he kept her well-fed, let her watch the movie Iron Man, and lent her his copy of the book Treasure Island. Although he said he couldn't bring himself to kill Sarah, it's more likely that he wanted to keep Sarah for himself. He shows a complete lack of remorse for assaulting Sarah and is seemingly indifferent to her suffering. He justifies what he did by listing off the relative positives, such as feeding her, letting her watch a movie, and letting her borrow a book. These were grooming behaviors in order to gain her trust, but in Matthew's mind, he thinks that what he did was okay because he felt like he took care of her. Matthew agreed to lead police to the tree where the bodies were in the Kokosing Wildlife Area, saying he had used a rig and pulley system to drop them inside. Investigators located the three missing people and the deceased family dog, and they were finally laid to rest by their loved ones. Hiding the bodies inside a hollow tree also fits into his strange delusions about trees and leaves. Forensic psychologists have explained that the leaves in his home may have been comforting to Matthew, and that he may have chosen to put the bodies inside of a tree because it was also comforting and familiar to him. On January 6, 2011, Matthew avoided the death penalty by pleading guilty to 10 felonies. Instead, he was sentenced to life in prison without the chance of parole. His foliage-filled home went into foreclosure later that month, with experts noting his particular obsession with trees as delusional. Ambulance service, is the patient breathing? No. They're not breathing? No. Okay. And who was it we're talking about? Um, Lexi, she's three. She's three? Bear with yeah. Me. Okay. So, she's unconscious and she's not breathing. So help has been arranged, okay. They say it takes a village and as a single mom of two young girls, Louise Porton knew that all too well. But in the space of just three weeks, both of her daughters tragically passed away. Yet in the 911 call, Louise appears oddly calm as she explains to the operator that her toddler is unconscious and not breathing. Did you hear the voice of a shocked and anguished mother, or is there something evil hiding below the surface? Let's find out, shall we? Our story begins in Rugby, Warwickshire, where 23-year-old Louise Porton grew up and lived with her two daughters, 17-month-old Scarlett Vaughn and 3-year-old Lexi Draper. Louise had lived in Walsall, West Midlands for a short time with her partner, Chris Draper. But when she was pregnant with their second child, the couple split up and she moved back to Warwickshire. Louise reportedly denied Chris any access to his children, and tragically, he never even got the chance to meet little Scarlett. Louise was an aspiring model who didn't shy away from X-rated photo shoots and spent a ton of time promoting herself on the website Purpleport under the name Lollipop. However, money was tight and she often struggled to get by as a single parent. As the stress mounted, Louise became increasingly irritable and began frequently leaving her children with family members and neighbors so she could go out on the town. While the circumstances weren't easy, several reports stated that the little girls appeared happy and well cared for, but that all changed on January 2, 2018. Louise brought Lexi to a local hospital for breathing problems, and doctors diagnosed her with a chest infection. But it wasn't quite that simple, and the truth was almost too horrifying to consider. Two days later, Louise called emergency services in the early morning hours, explaining that she had gone to check on her sleeping daughter and found her unresponsive. Paramedics rushed to the scene and transported Lexi to the hospital, but no one could understand why she was so ill. The toddler was clearly in pain and having trouble breathing, but with no other explanation, doctors again treated her for an infection and sent her home. But then on January 15th, Louise called emergency services once more, saying that Lexi was alive but not feeling well. When paramedics arrived, they found the three-year-old pale and mottled, with blue lips and rigor mortis already taking effect. It was clear that she'd been deceased for quite some time at that point, but what really stood out to everyone was Luisa's odd behavior. She seemed unfazed by her daughter's death, with one onlooker noting she seemed more like someone who had lost their goldfish. Furthermore, surveillance footage from the night before her death showed Lexi looking full of life as they entered their home. Louise explained that she thought Lexi might have caused her own death by hitting herself in the head with toys. But this tragedy was only the beginning. 
It's possible the two times Luis took Lexi to the hospital for breathing problems were just a test to see if she would be suspected of hurting Lexi. When her daughter was sent home with her both times, Luis may have thought she could get away with murder. It is really difficult for people to believe that a mother could kill her own children. She may have waited to call paramedics until she was absolutely certain that Lexi would not be able to be revived, which is why rigor mortis had already started. She wanted to ensure that there was no chance that Lexi would be saved. While planning for Lexi's funeral, people were very bewildered by the supposedly grieving mother, as she was reportedly heard laughing and using FaceTime to make arrangements with an unknown man. However, no one could have predicted that yet another tragedy would occur just two days later and only 18 days after Lexi's death. On February 1st, Louise summoned an ambulance to help Scarlett, who she claimed had now fallen ill like her sister. But before they could dispatch anyone, Louise said she was too worried to wait for them and that she would just drive to the hospital. Strangely, Louise didn't seem to be in much of a hurry as she stopped at a nearby petrol station to fill up on gas and make a small purchase before pulling over and finally calling for an ambulance. Paramedics came and discovered baby Scarlet lifeless in the back seat with pale skin and blue lips. She was formally declared dead upon arrival at the hospital, with no explanation for what caused her sudden demise. Sensing that something was very wrong, paramedics contacted the Warwickshire police, who commenced a full murder investigation into the two deaths. And no one could believe the true horror they would uncover. Louise may have felt that it was less suspicious that the children died in separate incidents several days apart. She may have also been emboldened by the fact that she felt she had gotten away with Lexi's death. Right away, investigators searched Louise's internet browsing history, and it yielded much more than they had anticipated. In the hours before Lexi's death, she searched, how long after drowning can someone be resuscitated? And how long does it take for a dead body to go cold up to the shoulder? Oh, and worst of all, she contacted 41 different people on a dating app just one day after Lexi died. Call me crazy, but that doesn't exactly fit the profile of a grief-stricken mother. The browsing history on Luis's computer is evidence that she didn't commit the murders in a moment of anger. For example, shaken baby syndrome often occurs in the heat of the moment when a caregiver is so frustrated that they shake their child. On the contrary, Luis carefully researched and planned in advance how she would kill her children. This was a very calculated decision. With this new information, investigators ordered post-mortem examinations of the girls, and what they found sent shivers down their spines. The medical examiner revealed that both Lexi and Scarlett had died from deliberate airway obstruction and that they each had unexplained physical injuries. Louise kept up with her social media accounts after the deaths, but naturally, people were skeptical of her story and soon she began receiving hateful messages. Her mother, Sharon Porton, remained supportive of her daughter, but when she tried to talk to her about the investigation, Louise allegedly got angry and punched her in the face. Just months after her daughters died, Louise posted on Facebook to a swap sell buy things and rugby page that she had two bins filled with little girls clothing that she was trying to sell. She added a photo that showed two garbage bags overflowing with Lexi and Scarlett's clothes for 20 pounds per bag. Apparently, no one responded to buy anything from her, even when she knocked five pounds off the price. On March 20th, 2018, Louise was arrested on suspicion of murdering her two daughters but it wasn't until 2019 that she was charged. Louise maintained her innocence, but during the trial, she appeared emotionless while the girl's father, Chris Draper, could barely hold it together. He stated in court, I can't understand why my two little girls were taken away because Louise wanted to sleep around. Prosecutors argued that evidence proved Louise mercilessly suffocated and strangled the two little girls to death. Moreover, doctors testified that Lexi's symptoms during her first two hospital visits were consistent with deliberate airway obstruction. Still, they weren't suspicious of Louise simply because they couldn't fathom a mother inflicting such terrible pain on their own child. What they didn't know at the time was that Louise had been taking topless photos in the hospital bathroom, answering requests for paid favors, and flirting with security guards while Lexi was fighting for her life just a few steps away. Doctors and nurses are what are referred to as mandatory reports. This means that they're required by law to report any reasonable suspicion of abuse. While it might seem unfathomable to a normal person to think that a mother could intentionally hurt her children, it occurs more often than we would like to think. Sadly, if these reoccurring hospital visits had been reported and investigated, things may have ended differently for this family. Now, you also might have wondered why Scarlett and Lexi had different last names, 
And let me just say that the answer to that question does nothing but further illustrate what an awful human being Louise Porton truly is. Following her breakup with Chris, a newly pregnant Louise quickly moved on to form a relationship with a man named Jason Vaughn, who she somehow tricked into believing Scarlett was his biological child. One of her relatives stated, she told him he was Scarlett's father, but she was lying. That's the sort of person she is. I grew up with her and she was vile. Another relative disclosed that Louise was never a normal child and that when she became a teenager, she would have violent outbursts and steal from her grandparents. The close source also said she regularly bragged about the money she made working as a prostitute. Even more disturbing truths emerged during the trial, including that Scarlett was already dead in the back seat of Luis's car when she stopped at the petrol station. In addition, court records showed that she had sent a message to someone that same night requesting money so she could take her to the hospital. Frustratingly, it was also uncovered that several people made reports about Luis to Warwickshire Social Services in the time leading up to Lexi's death, but they obviously failed to intervene. There was likely a prior history of physical and or emotional abuse by Luis toward her children before the murders were actually committed. Luis read a statement in her own defense saying, My children were never an inconvenience to me and I accommodated my lifestyle and personal life around them. Yeah, sure. The trial lasted 28 days and Luis was found guilty of both murders. Upon sentencing, the judge stated, One way or another, you squeezed the life out of each of your daughters, only calling emergency services when you knew they were dead. Louise Porton was sentenced to a minimum of 32 years in prison. More than a year after the untimely deaths, Chris Draper finally got to lay his daughters to rest in a beautiful Walsall funeral. Unfortunately, however, Louise managed to inflict one more tragedy from behind bars. On the second anniversary of her granddaughter's deaths, Louise Porton's mother took her own life, never able to come to terms with what her daughter had done. Now, if this case didn't have you absolutely fuming, then I don't know what will, but fortunately, with Louise locked up, there's one less cold-hearted criminal among us. When 11-year-old Shauna Howe left home for a Girl Scout Halloween party, her parents could have never imagined that it would be the last time they'd see her alive. Nearly 10 years later, DNA evidence led investigators to a local man named Ted Walker, who was finally ready to reveal the horrifying truth that there are far more frightening things than witches, ghosts, and vampires lurking around on Halloween. Our final story takes place in Oil City, Pennsylvania, where Shauna Howe lived with her mother, Lucy, and her stepfather, John. On the morning of October 27, 1992, Shauna left for school dressed as a gymnast in a turquoise bodysuit with black stripes. Later in the day, the fifth grader had plans to sing for senior citizens in the community with her Girl Scout troop before heading to a Halloween party at the local church. At just before eight in the evening, Shauna began the familiar half-mile walk home from the party, but police received a bone-chilling 911 call just minutes later. Dan Payton, an Oil City resident, claimed he had just witnessed a kidnapping. He said a slender, scruffy-looking man smoking a cigarette snatched a little girl and he heard muffled screams as he forced her into a boxy, rust-colored car and sped off down the road. Meanwhile, Shauna didn't make it home in time for her 8 o'clock curfew, so John called Lucy, who was at work, to tell her the unsettling news. Lucy began calling Shauna's friends and anyone she might be with while John scoured her regular walking route, but there was no sign of her anywhere. Finally, when two hours passed and she still hadn't returned home, her parents frantically called the Oil City Police Department and reported her missing. Suddenly, the sleepy little town was abuzz with police officers and FBI agents desperately trying to locate the missing scout. Oil City residents took notice and quickly joined in the search efforts. Two days later, Shauna's uncle discovered her turquoise and black bodysuit in the woods on the edge of town. Her family struggled to hold on to hope, but unfortunately, the worst was yet to come. The next morning, searchers located Shauna's body in a creek bed below an abandoned railroad bridge, just a few hundred yards away from where her costume had been found the previous day. She was lying face down between a log and a rock, with obvious signs of physical trauma to her head, chest, and arms. Additionally, state troopers noted that her shoes had been neatly placed on the bridge above, leaving her socked feet partially submerged in a shallow stream. Shauna's uncles were handed the grueling task of identifying the body which they tearfully confirmed to be their beloved niece. As Oil City police began launching a formal homicide investigation, they canceled Halloween indefinitely and urged parents to keep a close eye on their children. 
Now, the circumstances surrounding Shauna's murder were odd, to say the very least. It almost seemed like someone was taunting them, because searchers had combed the exact area the day before and found nothing. An autopsy uncovered traces of seminal fluid on Shauna's bodysuit and concluded that she'd been assaulted before being thrown from the bridge. The young girl suffered a broken arm and dislocated shoulder, which indicated that she was still alive and trying to break her fall. Making things even more horrific, she also suffered multiple rib fractures from hitting a concrete pier on the way down. Her cause of death was listed as severe blunt force trauma to the head and chest. Detectives questioned everyone close to Shauna, even collecting DNA from her 12-year-old brother, but their efforts yielded no results. So they turned their attention to any men in the area matching Dan's description of the kidnapper. That's when 33-year-old Eldred Ted Walker came into the picture. Beyond looking the part, Ted also owned a car suspiciously similar to the one Dan saw that night. However, he denied knowing anything about Shauna's murder and willingly submitted a DNA sample that did not match the one found at the crime scene. So while it looked like a solid lead at first, he was free to go, and from there, the case seemingly hit a dead end. Then, exactly five years later, on October 27, 1997, another little girl went missing in Oil City. Four-year-old Shanae Freeman was abducted from her front yard, and after a harrowing all-day search, 17-year-old Nicholas Bowen confessed to assaulting and murdering her. Nicholas led investigators to her body, which had been hidden under a pile of leaves in the woods, and he was eventually sentenced to life in prison without parole. Oil City residents were still tormented by Shauna's murder when little Shanae was taken, and they couldn't help but notice the similarities between the two cases. Still, there was no evidence to suggest that Bowen was also Shauna's killer, and the case went cold for another five years. It also seems unlikely, but not impossible, that Bowen could have killed Shauna five years prior when he would have only been 12 years old. Someone threw Shauna, who was still alive and likely struggling, off a bridge, which would have required a lot of strength. It would have been extremely difficult for someone who was a similar age as Shauna to have the physical ability to do this. By 2002, DNA technology had improved tremendously, so detectives requested a new examination of a swab taken from Shauna's mouth. It matched the seminal DNA found on her clothing, but they didn't know who it belonged to, yet. Then, after catching wind of an inmate named Timothy O'Brien bragging about killing Shauna to his cellmate at the Venango County Jail, investigators jumped at the chance to get his DNA. Timothy and his brother James lived in Oil City but were not initially suspects in Shauna's case because they were both believed to be in jail at the time of the attack. Unfortunately, Timothy's DNA wasn't a match, but detectives couldn't shake the feeling that he was somehow involved in Shauna's murder. When the chief investigator on Shauna's case retired, it was handed off to a new detective who decided to review files from back in 1992, and what he found was stunning. The brothers had actually made bail just before Shauna's abduction and were not detained at the time of her slaying. Officers raced to get a DNA sample from James, who was serving time in prison for an unrelated attempted kidnapping charge. He agreed, and when the results finally came back from the lab, all jaws hit the floor. It was a positive match to the samples taken from Shauna's bodysuit and mouth. However, with neither brother matching the eyewitness description, investigators knew they needed to plan their case carefully and gather more evidence to secure a conviction, so they called in Ted Walker. Beyond looking the part, he was known to hang around with the O'Brien brothers. Believing he may have served as an accomplice, detectives grilled him on his relationship with the O'Brien brothers and learned that the three were closer friends than they originally thought, who all shared a hatred for the Oil City Police Department. When investigators formed Ted about the DNA evidence against James, he stated that some really bad people might have entered his home to do a disgusting thing. He then confessed that all three had participated in the kidnapping of Shauna as a prank to make the police appear foolish. Ted explained that he saw her walking down the street and approached her, asking about Girl Scout cookies and hugging her. Then he put his hand over her mouth and pushed her into the car with the O'Brien brothers before they took off. When asked why they were using his vehicle, Ted told police he was letting them borrow it temporarily. Ted claimed he went home separately and that James and Timothy later arrived with Shauna. He said they brought her upstairs while he made spaghetti and that he could hear the little girl screaming, get off me, let me up, let me go. He allegedly demanded that the brothers leave his house with Shauna and they supposedly did. Ted adamantly claimed to have played no role in her death. Now, it's important to note that Ted's story changed several times throughout the investigation, but this is the one he stood by during the trial. Ted Walker ultimately accepted a plea deal that involved testifying against the O'Briens in exchange for a lesser sentence, 
He pleaded guilty to third-degree murder and kidnapping and was given a punishment of 20 to 40 years in prison. It seems unlikely that Ted was only a participant in the initial kidnapping and then was not involved at all in the assault or murder. He had a pretty good motivation to lie about the extent of his involvement as he would get a lesser sentence by testifying against the other two. It's a common practice in multi-defendant criminal cases for a prosecutor to offer a lesser sentence to one defendant if his or her testimony is necessary to convict the other defendants. In the case here, the prosecutor may not have had enough evidence without Ted's testimony to secure a conviction for James and Timothy. While it isn't ideal to give a criminal a lesser sentence than they may deserve, sometimes it is the best way to ensure the more culpable people involved get convicted. Finally, in 2005, James and Timothy O'Brien stood trial for kidnapping and murder charges. While they were both acquitted of first-degree murder charges, the brothers were found guilty of second- and third-degree murder as well as kidnapping and conspiracy. During sentencing, the judge stated, This world was a better place because of Shauna, and it will be a better and safer place without the both of you walking free ever again. At long last, justice for Shauna came when James and Timothy O'Brien were sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole.